<laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so as people know, I'm Diane Sayer, and I'm running for Congress because the world and our nation are facing an existential crisis. We have a president who, according to the Israeli press and U.S. military sources, has encouraged Netanyahu to launch a strike on Iran, which could plunge us into thermonuclear war. Uh, we, the entire European banking system is admitted to need at least four trillion euros in bailouts. And therefore, what urgently needs to be done, number one in the United States, is we have to reinstate FDR's Glass-Steagall Banking Act. We have to separate the commercial banks from the speculative banks and stop these bailouts. Number two, we have to restore the American system of national banking and credit as understood by Alexander Hamilton. That means no more Federal Reserve, and it means the ability to fund great projects such as the type that FDR built to get us out of the Depression. Specifically, I'm proposing the North American Water and Power Alliance, which was a project from the 60s supported by both Kennedys, launched by Senator Frank Moss of Utah, which would bring water from Alaska, where there is a massive runoff into the Arctic Ocean, down into the Great Lakes region, all the way to Arizona, New Mexico. This project would employ about 4 million people, many of them for 30 years. And had this been built in the 60s when it was proposed, all of the flooding and droughts and devastation of the extreme weather of last year would not have had the impact that it had. So these are the three things that I believe urgently must be done. A return to Glass-Steagall banking, a return to the national system of national banking and credit, and the construction of NAWAPA. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, uh, my name is Jason Castle. And, and before I get started, first let me just thank the, uh, the Bergen Grassroots Organization and the Ethical Poetry Society for, uh, for hosting this event. I do understand that uh, many, many of us, if not all of us, have busy schedules. Uh, some schedules more busy than others. Uh, but um, I do appreciate everyone being here. Uh, this is an incredibly important election. And it's an incredibly important election for a number of reasons. The issues before us threaten the very core of our nation. We have a failing educational system. We have <coughs> record high levels of unemployment. We have a tax code and a tax system that is not fair for all Americans. And we have our young men and women abroad in conflicts where they should no longer be. We have an opportunity in this election, in the 5th Congressional District, more in this election than any other time, because the tables have actually been turned. The district now is more democratic than it, than it once was, more democratic than it's ever been. You know, uh, my campaign, we, the numbers that we received said it was a 52-48 split. 48 being Democratic, 52 being Republican. And I read today that it's actually a little bit better. It's uh, 49 Democratic and 51 Republican. So we're we're, great, we're gaining percentage points every you know every day. But we cannot squander the opportunity that we have in this election and allow Scott Garrett to stay in office. Now, I believe that forums like this are important because they allow you all as voters the opportunity to question us and our agenda get a sense of our character, get a sense of our integrity. As a Marine, what I stand on is my integrity, and I stand on the fact that I believe that I am the right candidate at the right time to make the right decisions, and make decisions that are in the best interest of the individuals and the people that are living in the 5th Congressional District. If you give me that opportunity, I promise you that I will go to Washington, and I will fight there as hard as I am fighting in this election. I will make sure that your voice is heard, that you are advocated and that we start to reverse some of the measures that have put us in this situation. As Diane said, you know, we are in dire times. But let me be clear, it was not a lack of Glass-Steagall that put us in these times. It was greed, short-sightedness, and corruption that put us in these times. My name is Jason Castle, and I'm running to be your next congressman. Okay, at this time we're going to open it up.
up to questions, I would please uh, ask you please to refrain from making loud noises in support or against somebody if they have something to say, and save your, your real applause to the end. Applauding is obviously okay, but let's not get vocal. Keep it as civil as possible. Questions from the audience? Let's start right out in front. Okay. Um, I think that uh, the issue of pay to play is probably, is probably larger even in Washington than it does in New Jersey. Do you have an unequivocal, unequivocal absolutely irreversible position on pay to play when you get to Washington? Okay. We'll start here and then Diane will have a chance to answer as well. I do. But let's 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 break down pay to play, and and let me explain my my position on it. If you are able to write a really bad check and donate it to a legislator, and then reap the benefits of being able to write that really large check by receiving a contract, I believe that is wrong. We've got large corporations like Boeing, and we've got smaller, small and medium-sized businesses that are fighting and vying for the same industry. We can't have a system in place that caters to only the biggest corporations and the biggest industries and the wealthiest. That's, that's not fair. We need to have a level playing field, whether you're a small, a medium-sized, or a large corporation. So I firmly believe that the system has to be fair, it has to be equitable, and more importantly, you know, we you talk about pay to play. If you have a government contract, you should be forbidden from writing for writing a check to any legislator who has any ability to sway a contract in your favor. You get a contract the old fashioned way, you're you work for it. You know, I work with contracts daily. If a school or an organization submits a contract to me for uh, IT equipment, I have to put forth a proposal that is the lowest number. I don't know what everyone else is doing, but if I were to make a donation to that educational entity so that they would favor my proposal, that's unethical and that's wrong. And I'm, I am opposed to that. I'm opposed to it on the educational aspect. I'm opposed to it when it comes to federal legislators. I'm opposed to it when it comes to local legislators. So I'm very much against a system that is unfair. Okay. Thank you. Diane? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, on the question, I was at a number of these Bergen County Board of Freeholder meetings where you fought and fought and fought. And I have to say, I was astounded that it took so long. You said a year. I knew it was many months to get to play reform in Bergen County a year. Yeah, it's outrageous. I mean, frankly, maybe I'm naive, and I've been a political organizer for 23 years. I thought the idea that you would have to make reform on, I mean, it just seems so obvious. Um, so, yes, I mean, I would take an unequivocal position on, on this question. I mean, it should be illegal. Also, the idea of corporate personhood. Corporations should not be allowed to give contributions to political campaigns. I think there's a bigger problem, however, which is that the American people feel disenfranchised and that people don't use their authority to speak out at town hall meetings, to confront their congressmen, that it's, it actually isn't just the case that money is power. The population has a lot of power and we have to mobilize people to use that power to change policy. But it, at any rate, that's my answer and, and congratulations to the people here who worked on that. A year. <laughs> we worked on it for six years. And it took a year after we had four guaranteed votes to get the back to vote on. Next question. Back. Uh, Mr. Mr. Castle, what is your position? You said something about last week. What is your position? My first question, the second one is, uh, given the type of uh, banking reform that it represents, uh, how things, how would things have been different, and um, is that enough to uh, correct a lot of the 
things that we have that are, that are problems right now. Let's, let's understand, first and foremost, that, um, as I said in my intro, it was greed, short-sightedness, and corruption that got us into this mess. That's what it was. Glass-Steagall is a tremendous piece of legislation. I mean, it's huge. And it was a piece of legislation that was drafted and enacted for the, t the early 20th century. If you look at what happened in the financial crisis of 2008, we had we had banks handling financial instruments that they didn't understand. We had people who were trying to make a quick buck. We had banks that were putting all their eggs in one basket. We'll call it the housing basket. And when it collapsed, the collateral that they had was our money. I don't think that we should have bailed out the banks. I, I think that we are in a situation where we need to have smarter regulation in Washington. You know, Glass Eagle brought forth the FDIC. But to say that there should be a definitive separation between commercial banks and investment banks, I'll ask you to look up some of the banks that did actually survive the financial crisis. They were the ones that were diversified. And with Glass-Steagall, that diversification wouldn't have happened. There were power brokers on Wall Street that made horrible decisions. But we cannot solve these times by simply saying we need to enact Glass-Steagall. These times are much more complicated than the times when Glass Steagall was initially enacted. Yeah, sure. um, well, uh, a year ago, Phil Angelides was the former treasurer of California, chaired a commission that investigated the causes of the collapse of 2008. And Glass Steagall's repeal was not the only cause, but it was a substantial one, which occurred in 19. 99 or 98, uh, as people may recall. And actually, um, I don't think it's the case that uh, many of our institutions are actually solvent. This whole thing has been masked by what Neil Borofsky, the former Inspector General of the TARP, said, which is now we've spent $29 trillion on bailouts. So we're experiencing now hyperinflation in the prices of commodities in the price of fuel, food, et cetera. If Glass-Steagall were to be reinstated, it would be a bloodbath for Wall Street. It would wipe out massive amounts of speculative money and banks, but that will not kill people. Cutting Social Security, cutting Medicare, cutting $4 trillion out of our budget because Standard and & Poor's and Moody's are threatening to downgrade our debt and dictating policy to the United States, that will kill people. So reinstating Glass-Steagall is only the first step, but it's an urgently necessary one. Next question. Back. Um, I guess my question is, what would each of you do in terms of a carbon tax or um, cap and trade to stop global to help stop global warming? Um, and the envi environmental general. Okay. I absolutely support, I mean, oppose carbon tax. There is absolutely no evidence that carbon dioxide produced by human beings causes global warming. We are experiencing extreme weather conditions, as is Saturn, Mars. There are intergalactic forces. Our planet has been in flux for at least the 4.5 billion years that it's been here. And it is highly arrogant to run around saying that human beings are causing climate change when climate has been changing on this planet for billions of years. But it is a pretext to demand that poor countries shut down development. It is a pretext to shut down our own development. We're shutting down nuclear power, which is a very clean, safe form of energy. And uh, 
and, and this will shut down industry and stop the planet from developing. So if you care to do the research and study, 40 top NASA scientists just wrote to the administration saying don't put out any more of this global warming caused by human beings. There is no scientific evidence to back it up. Um, I believe that your question uh, referred more to cap and trade. Uh, companies produce tremendous amounts of waste. We know this, which is why we have cap and trade. I believe if a company is producing tremendous amounts of waste, we need to put forth smarter regulations, one, that hold them accountable, and two, that require them to, re to minimize the amount of waste that they may be producing. We all produce waste. I mean, we're, we're, we're human beings. We, we produce waste. But corporations don't have stringent enough regulations, smart regulations, to keep them from doing it. I, when it comes to global warming, well, we emit a lot of heat. I'm not talking about individuals, I just mean we've got cars on the roads, we have factories that are billowing, you know, steam and smoke, we watch the, uh, the, the polar ice caps melt, we, I mean, we, we see all these things that are going on. And to put on our blinders and say that, well, we're not causing these problems. We're, anyone who says that, a bit misguided. We may not necessarily <laughs> be able to pinpoint the cause of every single issue, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't change our habits to prevent ourselves from contributing to the cause. So for cap and trade, I think that we need to hold companies accountable, especially if, they, if they're creating tremendous amounts of waste. And I think that we need to hold other companies accountable so that they want to produce less waste. Thank you. Next question. Here. Yeah. Um, I'm a Democrat. Could you stand up so we can hear you? Sure, sure. Jack. Yeah, I, I am a Democrat, and I wanted to preface my question with something. I do have a question. Um, I'm a Democrat who is very troubled by the behavior of Barack Obama. And, for example, this Libya war was completely illegal. He did not consult the Congress. And it seems to me that he's doing exactly the kind of thing that Bush and Cheney did, especially when he talks about Iran and Syria. So, Walter Jones, Congressman, put forward a resolution, HCR 107. We're out of time. Can you give, if you have a question? The constitutional principle is this. He can't invade another country without consulting Congress and asking for their permission. The resolution says that if he does this again, he will face impeachment. Do you support that position? Well, I, I appreciate you introducing yourself at the beginning, um, letting me know that you're supporting uh, Diane's campaign. So. Uh, uh, I'll take the bait. Um, <laughs> here's, here's what I'll say to you. Here's what's deeply troubling to me. It's troubling to me when I walk outside and I see pictures of our president with a Hitler mustache. That troubles me. It's troubling to me that we're calling for the impeachment of a president where in this democracy, if you are very much against what the president is doing and the actions that he's taking, then run against him. As a matter of fact, by, by asking for the impeachment of the president, you yourself are tacitly supporting his re-election. So I thank you for that. But if you don't agree with his actions, run a candidate against him. I don't think that his actions in Libya, we're on top of the I can tell you as a service member that I appreciate him not putting boots on the ground because I was in the infantry. And if we can utilize the technology that we have to stop genocide, to stop atrocities across the globe, and we can do it in a way that clearly Congress, though there are a lot of arguments out there that it may have been unconstitutional, they haven't taken action. So perhaps those actions were not unconstitutional. They have not impeached the president. But there's got to be a better way than just going out 
and, and putting Hitler mustaches on the president and, and saying that we need to impeach him. If you firmly feel that way, then I would urge you to run a candidate against him. Rather than saying impeach him, I see no calls. Um, if Obama succeeds in unleashing a thermonuclear war, he will kill people orders of magnitude more than Hitler. However, the mustache actually was put on Obama because of his health care plan, which seems to be modeled on the T4 useless eaters idea. And this is the fight over the Independent Payment Advisory Board. And by the way, I would support Walter Jones. HCR 107 because it is an impeachable offense for a nation to lead a country into war without authorization of the Congress. Um, on the Independent Payment Advisory Board, the idea of having a group of people, statisticians, determine whether it is a worthwhile investment for someone to have health care, to get life-saving treatment that they need based on their age, their weight, if they smoke, and to make this decision now when we've spent $29 trillion on bailouts and to say that people who have nothing to do with the family, nothing to do with the doctors, are going to determine whether a person has a right to health care is a slippery slope which was brought up at the Nuremberg Tribunals. And it is a question of what people think is the value of human life in this country. Over here? Yeah, the, uh, the gorilla not in the room tonight is the one that's sitting right there. And I have the uh, privilege of uh, tracking what he has said in public for uh, more carefully and doing more transcribing of what he said than anybody else, and I believe, in this township and probably anywhere. So I'd actually like to sort of ask a few questions on his behalf tonight. Uh, I'm a very fierce opponent of his. Uh, one question. Okay. The one question. The one question is: Do you believe, as does he, and he said it very specifically in, in May of 2007, in the context of throwing a member out of the uh, planning board off the off the planning board in Teaneck, do you believe that diversity, because it's not in the Constitution, is an inappropriate term to be used in American politics? Thank you. Do you want to? Sure. Take a shot at this. I, I think I understand that you're asking if diversity is an inappropriate term. Nevertheless, let's look into it. That's right. Are we not all diverse? I mean, we we are a nation of diversity. There are a lot of there are a lot of words in the English language that I think are not appropriate in politics, but diversity is not one of them. Right? As a matter of fact, if we don't embrace our diversity, we'll end up with Congressmen like Scott Garrett, who don't represent our diversity. So, no, I don't agree that we should uh, ban the word diversity from, from from government. I think that that is just foolish. Um, we need to embrace our diversity, and we need to ensure that we are representing it and advocating for it in Washington. Want to applaud? I just say I don't see any reason for banning the use of the Diversity that's uh, Hi, question uh, on social <coughs> issues, uh, I guess for both of you. Uh, what are your positions on abortion and on marriage equality? You want to take that first? Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Well, the short answer is I don't think Roe versus Wade should be repealed. I support marriage equality, but I also have to say that I oppose these being the major issues in elections when we are facing a civilizational crisis. And I think we urgently have to address the blowout of the financial system, which is going to affect everybody alive and yet to be born, uh, and this war threat, which also is a huge menace to civilization as a whole. We should be talking about these issues. We absolutely 100% should be. To, I'm going to try to tackle two questions in, in 90 seconds, but um, <clears throat> first and foremost, marriage equality is a civil rights issue. 
our government has no responsibility, no, in no way, shape, or form should our government be dictating what individuals and what classes of people get certain civil rights. I think we've, we've already seen that in our history. And um, it is because of civil rights that I'm able to stand before you today. I can tell you that my wife is sitting here, and the love that we share, the way that we've committed ourselves to one another, is not going to be broken or bent because other individuals, may they be of the same gender or not, are given those same civil rights. We were married before our church. Our church defined marriage, not my government. I am pro-choice. Asterisk. Here's the asterisk. I believe that it is a, a woman has the right to choose. But I do believe that in this country, we have, we need to lower the rate of abortions. But anyone who thinks that a woman who goes into a clinic to have an abortion is making a cavalier decision is truly misguided. We, we bear responsibility both as men and women to, to act responsibly. And as adults, we owe it to our children to educate them and teach them to make responsible decisions. So I am very much pro-choice, and I am very much for marriage equality. Question in the front row. Yeah, hi. So you guys are both running for federal office, Congress. You guys are representing the whole nation as a whole. And clearly, we're going through a great crisis in the nation where there's no jobs, highest unemployment rate, even higher than the Great Depression right now. So what are you, what are we going to propose to the American people uh, to bring to bring a higher form of productive production back to this nation? Like, because you guys are running for Congress, you have to represent the nation as a whole. Are you asking what are, what are the candidates proposing for jobs to create yeah, jobs? Yeah, in the millions. That's What's it. your proposal to create jobs? Okay. This is not something that we can answer in two minutes, so let me just preface it uh, by saying that if we, we could, it would have been done. Uh, here's what I believe that we need to do. We need to create coalitions. We need to create coalitions between community colleges and universities and trade organizations and the companies that are actually creating jobs. We need to create a pathway because if we can bridge the divide between these, these organizations and the jobs that are actually being created by corporations, we can better prepare our long-term unemployed to be much more, I'd say, um, prepared for the 21st century. So what I would love to do and what I will champion in Washington as your congressman is making sure that we're leveraging the strengths that we do have. If I go to a corporation I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. My mother-in-law is one of the long-term unemployed. She lives with my wife and I. And it's a tremendous blessing because we have two daughters. She was in the housing market. When the housing market tanked, that is exactly the industry where she had an expertise. But had we had a, uh, a coalition or had we had you know, a partnership where corporations that were creating jobs were creating training programs for those real jobs, she could have very easily learned a new career. We don't have that. Instead, we have the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, where individuals call up once a week and they're asked questions, and I know this because I was unemployed when I came out of the Marine Corps. Are you ready, willing, and capable of working? Are you ready, and, ready, willing, and capable uh, to work? Did you look for work this week? Did you work this week? That's not helping people create jobs. But the money that we're poorly investing, we can invest it better, smarter. We can, as the government, we can create an environment where corporations can create more jobs, and we can do that by partnering with community colleges and trade organizations to make sure we're training individuals in new careers. And those training programs translate into real jobs. Yes. Um, well, I would say, first of all, we, we need a national mission. For example, the space program. Under NASA, the government employed about 36,000 people, but 400,000 people were employed in the private sector supplying parts and 
everything for NASA. That requires, again, a return to Glass-Steagall and a credit system and a solvent banking system. Also, what I referenced earlier, NAWAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance, which is a ready-to-go massive project that would employ over 4 million people, at least 100,000 in the 60s, they estimated 100,000, I imagine, would be higher now because we've shut down so much of our machine tool capability, so much of our concrete production, our steel production. So 100,000 plus in the actual building and a multiplier factor of millions in all of the places where you would have to build up civilization to support the workforce. Just as Lake Mead and the Hoover Dam was constructed at the time in the middle of nowhere and became a metropolis, the hub of Nawapa in the United States is the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho. So it would be a massive driver for millions of jobs. And the nation needs a mission. That's how you get jobs, a mission and a purpose for the nation. Well, good. Yeah. Hey, this is for Mr. Castle. I'm going back to Glass Steagall. Uh, louder. You could speak louder, but they, they can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm going back to Glass Steagall. Um, you mentioned that you thought that things had changed a lot since you know since Roosevelt's time in a way that Glass Steagall would be less effective. Could you comment more on that? Because I understand that. Since Glass-Steagall was repealed in 1999, like all types of uh, derivative products and speculative things kind of appeared, you know, out of nowhere in, in the market. They let our deficit go sky high. I have two minutes to answer this question. All right, so I'm going to take the first, first portion of the question just to respond to something that was said. The reason that we have record high unemployment is not because is not solely because of the, the jobs that are there. We don't have people who are properly trained to take on some of the jobs that we create. If, if it were that easy, if you could just create a job in a completely different industry where someone has absolutely no experience and they would just get hired because that job was created, then what you said might actually hold water. When it comes to Glass-Steagall, What's important to remember is that some of the things that brought down our economy were still legal under Glass-Steagall. What's important to understand is that rather than looking to the past, because I, I, I don't believe it, that there's any perfect piece of legislation, but I do believe that we need to learn from this crisis and put forth s smart regulation to keep some of these derivatives perhaps from being created. The problem is too big just to say that Glass-Steagall is going to solve it. And I'm sure you know it's popular, clearly, from all the questions about it, to just say, well, Glass-Steagall was overturned essentially in 1999 and then shortly thereafter we had this economic crisis. Yeah. Now we, we had this economic crisis because people were greedy and they were corrupt and they were short-sighted. We had this because they were gambling with our money. But let's not forget that some of those bets that were diversified actually survived this economic downturn because they didn't put all their eggs in one basket. Look at the entirety of the issue and let's not just name a piece of past legislation and say that that's a silver bullet because there is no silver bullet. Well, I, one of those, yeah, I, I will ask, we, we, Glass Steagall is quickly becoming well trotted ground already and I would hope that we can get on some other issues if you want to. Okay. Okay. okay, we have another question. Another question. Mark. My name is Mark Quick, and I'm the report party for, for Congress here in the 5th District. One of the things here, I just put a press release out last week for, is right now Congress is debating what the interest rate is for our student loans. Right now, the interest rate is 3.4%. It 
If Congress doesn't enact come in July, it's going to raise to 6.8%. I'm going to ask everybody in here and the other, my fellow other candidates up here, to join with me and ask for Congress to extend the interest rate at 3.4, and then in the near future, reduce the interest rate from 3.4 to 1.7, and then actually consider the fact that it's our money the Federal Reserve is taking and giving to our kids. How much money in the future do we really want to profit off of our kids? Question. So, Would you support that? You support the bid? Um, yes, that's the short answer. Yes, we should reduce the interest on those, and there's more, but we'll, we'll get to that in other questions. You threw a lot of numbers at me. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'd like to do something very different than what Scott Garrett does. I, I, I'd actually like to read your proposal and, <laughs> and uh, you know, see the facts behind it before I can tell you that your proposal is something that I would support. What I do believe is that we need to make education more affordable. I'm paying off student loans right now. My wife went to Cornell. She has two master's degrees. You know we're paying off those student loans as well. But our, our children deserve the opportunity to go to college if they choose to. Education shouldn't be a privilege. It should be something that everyone has an opportunity to do. Do we need to lower interest rates on student loans? Well, I just paid Sally Mae, so I believe we do. Um, but before I can actually say yes to your specific proposal, because you know, a lot of things sound great in, 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 in sound bites, but I'd like to actually look into it. I'd actually like to see you know, if there's anything else in there that is, it's going to go up here so that we can lower it here. I know the importance of education. I know the importance of making it affordable. I believe that every child should have the opportunity to go to college if they choose to. And if, if we can lower interest rates so that children today don't have more debt to bog down their future because of the cost of college, if there's something we can do to prevent that, then we should do it. Yes. Uh, send your press release to me all at bourbongrassroots.org and I'll send it to our 300 members. Great, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, my question is mostly for Mr. Chastity. Uh, you said you supported our uh, conduct in Libya. Uh, what are your thoughts on Syria? Because uh, my feeling is the U.S. has a lot more issues in countries that have oil than countries that don't have oil. I, I, I thought someone was going to ask about Syria. Um, and let me let me be clear. Um, I don't I don't think that there's anyone in the room who would agree with the genocide. Uh, I would hope not. What we had in Libya that is different than Syria, was we had international support. Now, one of the, one of the, the, the components of, or one of the pillars of my campaign is that I don't believe that we should be putting our young men and women in places around the world that they don't need to be. But when it comes to international incidents, such as Syria and Libya, such as Iran. We cannot have a nuclear Iran. A nuclear Iran is detrimental to Israel, is detrimental to America, is detrimental to the world community. But we need to speak with one voice out against these things. We had international support in Libya. We're trying to build that for Syria. It can't be the United States alone taking action. We, we can't do that. So what's going on in Syria is horrible. There is a madman in power. He is exterminating his people. But we need to get the world to commit. We can't carry that burden. Well, uh, first of all, I believe it was leaked to the New York Times that the reason, Bob, one of the reasons why Bob 
Gates left as defense secretary is that we did not have international support in Libya, that NATO put a fig leaf over it, but basically the whole operation was run by the United States, and it was an illegal and unconstitutional operation. Secondly, we heard this story before about Saddam Hussein. That worked out really well. We killed anywhere between 600,000 and a million Iraqi civilians, not to mention thousands of our own soldiers. And the point about Syria, these, this is empire. The transatlantic system is bankrupt. You have people in the city of London and Wall Street who would like nothing better than a major war. If we get involved in putting up buffer zones around Syria, we are in a head-on confrontation with Russia. The Russians have said so. The Chinese have said that they consider our massive upgrading of our bases in Australia and our moving of nuclear submarines all over the Pacific a reason why the Chinese may be considering changing their policy of no first use of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, this is not in the U.S. media, but if you want to Google and look up what the Russians and Chinese are saying, I would recommend that you do it. These wars have nothing to do with Iran and Syria. There is no evidence that Iran is building a nuclear weapon. Nothing has changed there since 2003 that is publicly known that is the content of the IAEA report. These wars are a product of a breakdown of a financial system. That's what should be addressed. Next question. Go ahead. Um, those of us in this room may not agree on everything, but I think we do agree that Scott Garrett is an extremely conservative uh, congressman, really very, very extreme, and that we would really like to see him defeated. So in your election, you know, if, if you get the nomination, how do you plan to conduct your campaign uh, so as to defeat Scott Garrett? Yeah, first out this. All right. Well, I intend to conduct my campaign as I have been conducting it, and I can tell you from what I know about the veterans groups and people that I've been meeting with all over the 5th District, including Warren County and Sussex County, that there are a lot of people, including many Republicans, who are extremely unhappy with him, including the veterans, interestingly, who he's treated abominably, apparently, which I didn't realize. So I think that were I to win the Democratic primary, I would have a very good shot at defeating him because of the networks that I've been building over the last year all over the district. And I agree, he is, uh, anyway, I would say, but, so, that's my answer. Thank you for the practical question. I appreciate it. Um, it's, we all are unified in our mission to defeat Scott Garrett. Um, but we're also unified in our mission to make sure that we're not replacing Scott Garrett with another Scott Garrett. Scott Garrett is, 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 is a very partisan individual. And I think you made him compliment by just calling him a conservative because I think he's well, well, well right of being exactly that. But how I will beat Scott Garrett. Well, first and foremost, we have to talk about the issues. We have to talk about the issues that are bringing our country down. We have to talk about the issues and educate people on the issues. And we have to let them know that the issues that are before us right now are the most important of our times. Now, we may disagree on what those issues are, but when Scott Garrett votes to repeal the Voting Rights Act, well, that's, that's something that very much bothers me. Now, he can raise two, three, four, five million dollars for his campaign, but he cannot raise enough money to erase his record in war. There's no dollar amount that's going to allow him to do that. So, what I believe is the opportunity in this election is to just talk about the things that he's actually done in Washington, to let people know how he has voted in Washington to let people know that he voted against the extension of unemployment benefits when his district had a rate of unemployment that was higher than the national average. To let people know that he voted against, well, aid for Katrina victims. 
to let people know that he, you know, to to let people know that he was one of the individuals who held our nation hostage last year during the grand bargain when our president sat down with the Speaker of the House and they were actually trying to work together to come up with a compromise, he was one of the individuals that crippled that negotiation. I will continue to do exactly what I've been doing in this campaign. I will, I will crisscross the district and I will meet as many voters as I possibly can and I will let them know what my vision is and let them know how Scott Garrett has voted. Chairman's privilege. Let's stay on the practical issue. Will you both tell us uh, how much time you have to devote to this campaign? Are you going to keep your jobs? I don't know. Are you both full-time employed? Just give us an idea. Let's get into the practical aspect of the campaign. Absolutely. Well, I will tell you that uh, just as I continue to devote myself to this campaign by showing up tonight, by crisscrossing the district, I think showing up tonight was a very, you know, it was a very big gesture now when I sat um, um, I'm going to continue to do what I've been doing. And fortunately, um, I have the backing of my employer. I, am, I do have a full-time job. Um, I've got two little girls, and as I said, my wife and I are paying off both loads of student loans. Um, but I do have the, the full backing of my employer, and after the primary, I am working now to put myself in a position so that I can be in the campaign full time. It may not be immediately, because I do have responsibilities, and I think that you would respect that I would take responsible action to make sure my, my household was in order, um, and not jeopardize the safety and well-being of my family. But just as I've been out every single day, just as I've been making calls every single evening, just as I've been meeting voters in the district on weekends and in all spare time, um, my wife can tell you it's true. Um, I will continue to do that, and I will only ramp that up because this is a very unique opportunity. We've never had an opportunity like this to write this district. So that's what I'll continue to do. Response. Well, okay. uh, well, fortunately, I have a peculiar situation, which is that I am a full-time political organizer. So it's not a conflict with my job to do this campaign. I also am a musician and direct a chorus, which has come in handy if people saw what we did to Governor Christie and Fairlawn <laughs> last year. Um, so, uh, also because I have been organizing, uh, as people may know, with LaRouche for 23 years and here in New Jersey about 20, I have a very substantial network of volunteers throughout the district and many of them have been going with us on weekends door to door, every weekend 30, 50 people and substantial networks all over the district to organize. Although I have to say, we have to save the nation. To be with Scott Garrett would be a very important aspect of that. We have to save the nation and maybe as part of defeating him we can also get rid of our governor. Um, this is uh, for uh, both the speakers. At this point, are you willing to pledge that the to endorse and to fully support the winner of the Democratic primary in the fifth district, even if the unlikely event occurs that it isn't either of you? Uh -huh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, no, I I would not. I, it depends on the policy. Mother said it when I was a child, and in the Marine Corps they said it, they echoed it again. Failure is not an option. So I will endorse myself when I win, um, and hopefully so will the other candidates. But the moment that we start looking for a, a back door or a way out, that's the moment that we should exit the race. So I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to support. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't commit to telling you that I will actively support um, the nominee. I, I'm just not prepared to, to think in that, uh, in that way right now. What I will tell you is that I will work hard to make sure that I am the nominee. I want to speak for Bergen Grassroots. I cannot, under any circumstances, imagine endorsing the absent candidate.
question. Here, here, that's you. Don't find you. Okay. In Congress, what would you do to improve the education of our children in America and to get us from stop from being a third world country in our education? We are falling very, very, very far behind on a special education advocate. And I can tell you we are in serious trouble. Jason, you take it first. First and foremost, I believe that we need to repeal No Child Left Behind. And we need to replace it. You can applaud. I know, that my, I, know that, I think that was my wife right here clapping on there. Now, because my wife is a teacher. We need to repeal No Child Left Behind. And we need to replace it with a program that teaches our children to be problem solvers and critical thinkers. We need to, we need to stop handcuffing our teachers and requiring them to teach to a test, but allow them to teach to the entire child to develop an individual who will assume the responsibility as we begin to relinquish them. We are, we, we have a, we have an educational system that's been failing for a very long time. And we are not so far gone that we can't bring it back. But we, we can't do it with no child left behind. And we can't do it by enforcing mandates that say that teaching children in California is the same as teaching children in New Jersey. There, there are very different needs in different school districts. So to, to put everybody in one specific box and say that we have to teach to every single child the exact same way does, is a disservice to our children. But it's also a disservice to us. Because think about your retirement. Think about that doctor who may not have been taught to be a critical thinker or a problem solver. If you're under their care, wouldn't you want to know that we invested as much as we possibly could in their education and we allowed their teachers the autonomy to teach their creativity and their passions, but also those teachers were held accountable for the, the, the standards and results? We have to repeal No Child Left Behind. We have to replace it with the program to teach them to think critically and problem solve. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for addressing the first part of, uh, I agree with repealing our child left behind and the question of critical thinking. I'll just, uh, I'll get back to the nation has to have a mission. I worked with children in Washington, D.C. I directed a children's fire of children of drug addicts. And one of the children said to me at one point, we were talking about what do you want to be when you grow up, he said, I hope I have a really nice funeral because his brother had just been shot to death. And if we have a culture where there is no future, where there are no jobs and there is no mission, we can do whatever we want on education. It will not work because people will not be inspired to learn and become true citizens. When I was a child, the space program had a huge impact on me and everyone in my class. Well, we got in trouble for was drawing spaceships on the margins of our papers. And when we were six years old, we knew the order of the planets, and we knew that parts of the spaceship came off when it went through the atmosphere, and we knew there was an atmosphere. And that's because the nation had a mission which was beyond the reach of what people were living in in the day. It had a mission for the future. And unless we restore that, we will not be able to educate our children. What is the reason for the failure of the U.S. education system? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> it's two minutes or less. Yeah, it's a similar This time, I guess it's, yeah, it's yours. And well, I would say in part the the inverse, um, which is that we've had a collapse. We've had a very bizarre value placed on money per se, as opposed to creativity. And um, I, I think there are certain things that are really problematic. We don't have a major commitment to public education anymore. It doesn't seem to me there's an idea that every single person has an equal right to a very high educational standard. And I'm not sure exactly how that shifted, but I know older people, like a, a great musician I knew, Bill Warfield, who went to public school in Rochester and he learned Latin, Greek, and German in high school. Uh, 
So I'm not exactly sure all the factors that went into reduce, reversing that, but I think that's what we have to look at. So you offer it, I can't answer the question that you asked. It, it's an incredibly it's a huge undertaking. What I can tell you is that we we can't assume that every child in a different classroom is prepared for that classroom. We, we can't. Uh, we have a number of, 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 of social issues that um, keep every child from being prepared. So my wife comes home every day as a teacher, uh, inspired by what her children are able to accomplish, but also disheartened that sometimes they enter her classroom without preparation to be there. I can't tell you everything that's wrong with the education system. I can tell you that a good step to, to correcting it would be to repeal No Child Left Behind, but I can also tell you that holding a teacher accountable for in eight hours of a day for what's not happening in the other 16 is not right. So, you know, there's a, there's a saying that says it takes a village to raise a child. I'm a product of the public education system, the public education system before No Child Left Behind, and I, I think I came out all right, but I know it wasn't perfect. I would like to make sure that our public education is one that gives our children an opportunity to succeed. And as it stands right now, it is not. That's why you asked the question. But there are so many other factors that are, that are contributing to it. Um, I'll leave it there. Hi, I'm running for council for Westwood. And Westwood has two to one Republican ratio. Um, I know one thing with Westwood and the other districts is all had to do with the Garrett is the flooding that with United Water. And Stand up, please. It had to do with the flooding with United Water and how they're not being accountable for letting the water out of the dam and running through the brooks and flooding um, towns after towns after towns and FEMA coming in with money and green acres. What can you do with our district, especially with Westwood being in the district, um, to help the, the uh, to hold United Water accountable because mm -hmm. as the mayor of Westwood has been trying to do is to get the DEP to limit the permits um, to how to drain the water. So my question is, would you be behind us to help us? Because we do need Senate, we do need Congress behind us to help us stop United Water. If, we, if we're able to pinpoint an issue, and I, I can tell you, um, I can't speak as articulately as I'd like to about it because maybe we can have a conversation afterwards to know some of the specifics. But if we can pinpoint an issue, if we can say, we know that the flooding is being caused because of this, um, not because of the way the community was designed or not because we don't have measures in different places to prevent it, but we can pinpoint an issue, and I think that we need to hold the company accountable. I will be very different than Scott Garrett because I will I will support legislation that brings money to our community, to the 5th Congressional District, to fight some of the flooding woes. That's something that he was very much against. That's a contrast that I'd like for you to recognize between he and I. If you know that flooding happens in your district and you have a degree of influence and a responsibility to your community, then voting against those issues is not in the best interest of your constituency. That's what he does. That is not what I would do. Um, similarly, I'm not, if it were clear that United Water were the cause of the problem, I would address it. I'm not sure. I haven't investigated. I heard recently that the National Intelligence Estimate just released a report saying that the United States was planning to do no new water management for 30 years, which I think is insane. I think the project that was on the table here for this giant tunnel from the flood out, it mm -hmm. sounds quite feasible. Someone has since informed me there's something else that's better. I'm not sure, but I think we actually have to take the thing about Nawapa, for example, when the Senator Frank Moss chose this giant, giant project over the whole continent. 
is he did extensive studies on all of the little flooding and drought issues, and he said you, what it appears is you actually can't solve them locally because the whole water plane is so interconnected that only large projects will address them. And that's why I think this tunnel idea of uh, former Congressman Rowe is very appealing. I think we really have to look at something like that because you also don't want a situation where you move water from one place and flood someone else, which seems to be how we're doing things these days. Also on Garrett, I mean, these people are so outrageous because they say the government shouldn't pay for anything. And then FEMA runs out of money. And my understanding is that we were taking money from Joplin to aid flood victims in New Jersey. I mean, why should the government be making a choice over who they can aid when you have people equally struck by disaster? Uh, so that's the other issue with Garrett, who obviously is guilty in making sure none of the emergency relief is funded. And then when it's needed, he's the first one screaming for it. Hi, uh, my name is Carol Hornline. Um, I happen to be a civil engineer specializing in water resources and flooding, and uh, this just happens to be my uh, area of expertise. Now, what, what, what would you do if, in my opinion, the problem actually stems from it, it needs to be solved locally with green initiatives? And the problem that we've been having is that. Um, that the problem, in order to solve this locally, we all have to take responsibility. And so, how would you address the problem if it's, it, it, it's something that's difficult to ask the voters to actually take responsibility? And politically, it's a difficult thing to do. What would you do um, you know, in order to uh, foster green initiatives that would you know, lead to building and things like that? that would locally address flood initiatives. What's your stance on green initiatives? I guess. You have to go for I mean, I'm not sure exactly which specifically green initiatives you mean. I mean, one thing I'll just say, I do think we have to build infrastructure for the population that we have. So if a so-called green initiative is to tell people that you should only use electricity at such and such hours, you should only flush your toilet during certain times, or you should whatever, we actually should have planned better and constructed our infrastructure to supply the needs of the population. If there are specific measures that people in a neighborhood have to know or have to, you know, do things a certain way, then obviously word should be gotten to the population to know that. But I, I, when you look at what has happened in our country over the last 30 years, the fact there's been virtually no investment in any kind of infrastructure whatsoever, and you have brownouts and blackouts and shortages of clean water, I don't think it's really acceptable to tell people they should change their behavior to address that. I think we need a program from the top that addresses the needs of the population as a whole. disagree with you on, in, in this regard. Sometimes people at the top don't know what's going on. They should. <laughs> and for myself, one of the first things I would do is I'd tell you I don't know everything. And I'd come and find you because you're an expert in this field and you can say, this is what's actually causing the problem. And get with other like-minded individuals like you who understand the nature of the problem. And if we can pinpoint what that issue is, and if that, you know, in this facet of, of the order of the community within the fifth congressional district, in order for us to combat this problem, we have to slightly modify our behaviors. Then we educate the people and we let them know that we're experiencing this problem, and we know if we just modify our behavior in this way, we all got to sacrifice. But this is the community that we love, this is the community that we live in, and we want to preserve it. This is a small sacrifice for us to preserve it. I firmly believe that when people are educated as to what the cause of an issue is, and if they have an opportunity to be part of the solution through a small sacrifice, I, I think that we would we all step up to do that. I was born in California, and, and during the time that I was there, there was a drought. And, you know, the, the 
town council got together and they put together a letter and they passed it out to all the residents. They mailed it to everyone. They said, we're going through a drought. So in order to, to save water, please only use, only water your lawns for this amount of time if you're going to do it. Please practice water conservation. Please do these things. And people in the community, because we, you know, we were informed, we, we complied. We understood the importance of it. We understood that we were all in it together. So I think that if we just inform the constituency, if we inform the individuals of the community, they'll comply as well. Back. The, um, right now it's my understanding that the nation is not in control of its own finance. So you have a financial crisis, Wall Street, et cetera. You've proposed a certain type of jobs project, corporate training, some other thing. You've proposed Nawaba. I want to know if you're going to get rid of that form of financial control, Wall Street and the Federal Reserve, which means that the nation doesn't run its own finances. We're not our own nation. What do you replace that with? You mentioned the National Bank. I'm not sure what your answer is. But how do you fund these great projects? It's going to take a lot of work. Go ahead. Can we all can we all agree that there's a lot of waste in Washington? That we're spending a lot of money in places that we probably shouldn't be spending it? I think that we can all probably come to agreement on that. For initiatives, I can't see the gentleman. Oh, well, we gotta step out of the way. Um, we can we can free up funding by doing things smart. Now, I don't. I don't agree with you know returning to a fiat system and, and a national money. You know, I don't agree with that. But I don't. I don't necessarily understand everything that I read on your website about that aspect. Um, and the issues are before us are are more important than um, than me going back to the website and trying to you know get a, a PhD on it. But what I will say to you is, um, um, what, what what I will say to you is. Yes, these projects are going to cost money, but we're wasting a lot of money right now. We we close uh, corporate tax loopholes. We, you know, we we understand that where we have wasteful spending when it comes to the way that we're approaching education. You know, we can't just strike one thing and expect that all those funds are going to go to pay for one of these projects. But we do address them, and we do government better. We do it smart. We're not doing that right now. So I'll be the first one to admit, yes, these programs will cost money. But I think that we can pay for them by closing corporate tax loopholes. And while we're on it, making our tax code fair and allowing everyone to pay their fair share. Got it. Um, first of all, I would say, in a sense, there's been that money itself has no intrinsic value. So we're not going to address this by moving money from one thing to another. As Borofsky says, we've issued $29 trillion so far, and I don't think anyone in this room, unless you're hiding something from us, has seen much of that $29 trillion. What Alexander Hamilton did was, after the American Revolution, our nation was in debt by $42 million, which was an enormous sum at the time. He consolidated that under the federal government, and then he went in debt even further, which is what would drive, you know, Rand Paul and and Garrett insane. He issued another ten trillion, ten million in those days, ten million dollars of debt to invest in building roads, building canals, and building the ability to pay our European allies back for everything that we owed them. So the idea of national banking and credit is that, in a sense, your collateral is the future state of your economy, which is why a balanced budget amendment is insane. It has nothing to do with the American system of banking. But the government has the authority to issue credit, which is directed for internal improvements, and it will generate enough, enough growth that not only you can pay off that debt, but as Hamilton found, he could pay off the $42 million from the American Revolution. We could pay off people's pensions and various things that have to be restored if we wrote off the speculative garbage, which would be eliminated with a reinstatement of Glass-Steagall. Uh, Our timekeeper. Gotta listen to the timekeeper. Gotta listen to the timekeeper. I'll, 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 I'll watch. Second. <laughs> you don't want to time your own question. <laughs> I'll listen to the answer. 
I would suggest that one of the things that's wrong with our tax system is that it runs to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, many of them exceptions to other pages. <laughs> How about the system of a one or two or maximum three page tax book? What stand would either of you take on that? <laughs> well, why don't you take it? It's a, well, you're up first, right? Yes, we have an incredibly complicated tax code. Um, and we have a, a, a tax code that is so complicated that it does nothing but really create lack tax loopholes and, and, and you know, line the pockets of, of special interest. And I think we all dread tax season. I know I do. Um, we do need to simplify the tax code. We need to go in and get rid of some of the corporate tax loopholes. We need to go in and make sure that it is a fair and equitable system. We can simplify. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm with you. You have hundreds and hundreds of pages, and, and then hundreds of those pages are offsetting other pages. That's why it's so difficult right now. That's why we always go to tax season. We do need to simplify the tax code, and that's something that I would be very much in support of in going down to Washington. Simplifying the tax code, making it something that's fair and equitable, making sure that corporations are paying their fair share, making sure that individuals are paying their fair share, and that it is something that I can't say we're no longer going to dread us, but at least something that we all at least better understand. Okay. Um, well, I'd certainly would favor simplifying it. I have to say this is not something I have studied in great detail, although it seems to me the system we have right now is highly inequitable and doesn't take into account which, in some way what's needed for a basic standard of living which should be protected and people who are way beyond that in corporations taxed more highly. But beyond that, I, I would have to really look into it, but it seems to me it doesn't have to be thousands of pages. <laughs> Trying to just get people who haven't answered, ask questions first. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it seems to me that um, I just want to make a little bit of a, a statement before I ask a question. It seems that uh, one of the reasons that so many people were interested in Glass Steagall was because, and uh, I want to get back to that, but that's because. One of the things it, that... It, it, it's, it's a glass eagle question. Because it's not a glass eagle question, per se. Then just please but ask what, the question because we're... I don't want to be rude about it, but we're... we're I understand. I understand that. Um, if we're going to put a band-aid on a situation instead of getting to the root of the problem, that's my statement first. Putting a band-aid on it is only going to cover it over. You have a boil on your back, you're not going to cover it with a band-aid, you're going to dig it out. The thing that we know from history is that Glass-Steagall was put in place, I'm going to ask my question, Please, because put in place in order to regulate something that needed regulation. Right now it's gone and there is no regulation. We have 27 or more trillion dollars of debt. It's not our debt. There's a bill called H.R. 1489 that was introduced by Captur and others in Congress right now. You're running for Congress. The support of that bill would be, would put back in place something that we need in order to take this, this debt off the American public. Have you read 1489? No, Have you read the Angeles Report? Those are my two questions. Are you trying or will you read that so that you will understand what it is that the American public has on their back? And I want to know what your feeling is about the Angeles Report and Glass-Steagall, not just who has Glass-Steagall, but 1489. We've had a lot of questions about Do this. you know about He's already said he hasn't read it, but okay. you're, you're getting to be in I understand that. Already done I, over, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to say that I think 1489 needs to be supported. So does okay. our other candidate know about 1489? I don't, I don't want to get into it. Which she supported. You know what? I, I appreciate that. We've, gone, we've done the Glass-Steagall talk. A lot that's here, and I'd like to move on from it. No, no, we're not going to go on to it. Next. <laughs> if a person doesn't have reasonably good health, he or she has virtually nothing. I'd like to know what your views 
are on an ultimate single-payer system that exists in every modern country in the world today. Simple fast. Okay. Um, I do support Conyers' bill for a national single-payer health care plan. I would support that. I think that was the second answer that didn't come back to Glass Steagall. So, um, I I uh, I am very much in favor of a single payer system. Um, but I also understand that right now we have the American uh, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act. Excuse me. Um, I haven't read. Those. I haven't read those. So. HR fourteen eighty nine. Okay. Thank you. We will, I will write it down and I'll make sure that I Thank do educate you. myself on it. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm going to agree with it, but I will. I will do that. Um, right now we have on the table the Affordable Health Care Act, and it is a tremendous advancement from what we had prior, which was nothing. Would I favor a single-payer system? In understanding it, I think it would be it would be a move in the right direction. But at the same time, I understand that with the Affordable Health Care Act, which is what is on the table right now, we have millions of students, uh, my campaign manager included, who were able to go back onto their parents' insurance until they were the age of 26. We, we, can't, we, we can't simply look for a silver bullet approach to certain things. When it comes to the Affordable Health Care Act, if you have insurance right now, uh, many of you may know, many of you may not know, that you're paying on average, families are paying on average $1,000 more every year in premiums and in procedural costs. We can't scrap this bill that we have, but we can make it better. And though I may support a single payer system, I don't think that we should scrap what we have. I think that we should make what we have better. And I, I hope that the Supreme Court um, upholds the constitutionality of the bill because it's a good start and maybe we can steer it more so in that direction. Yeah. Mr. Castle, I have to take exception to something that you said about had Obama's actions in Libya then a violation of the Constitution, then an impeachment proceeding would have already occurred in Congress. Because I think what's missing from Congress, and this, this interfaces with a, another question that was asked about were either of you to secure the nomination, how would you garner votes in the rest of the district from Republicans against Garrett? What's on the minds of a lot of Americans is the fact that there is no leadership in Congress. There's very few people that are willing to stand as an individual, even to the point of bucking their own party. Now, question, yes. please, please. So there was actually a lawsuit against the Obama administration on Libya, but it was thrown out for being partisan, except for the fact that it was brought by the Democrat, Dennis Kucinich. So what qualities do either of you possess that would give voters the confidence, including Republicans in the district who don't like the Republican Party, they don't like the Republican candidates, so they're not, they're not inspired? What qualities do you have that would give us the confidence that you would stand on principle if you were elected to Congress? Well, I'm, I'm going to, I know that that was directed at me because I had a chance to, to meet you outside the BCDC. You've got some very strong support. I'll tell you that. Uh, <clears throat> standing on principle is all I've ever done. My integrity is something that I value. It's something that's been ingrained in me as a child. It's something that was reinforced in me. I am not a partisan person, and I will not be a partisan politician. When you stand on partisan ideology, you ignore the fact that some of the issues that are before us transcend those ideologies. Now, <coughs> we can disagree, um, but Where I'm going to differ from Scott Garrett 
is I'm I'm going to show the people of the 50th congressional district that I am a person of high integrity. Now, I am a person who's not going to take a partisan stance because it's the bill that is before me isn't politically expedient or popular. You're sending me to Washington to be a leader. And I agree with you. There is a, there is a lack of leadership in Congress. I, that's, that's why we're both here. Scott Garrett is not a leader. Scott Garrett is in the pocket of insurance companies. Scott Garrett gets huge sums of money written to his campaign to make sure that he's protecting those interests. We recognize that that's a problem. Early on in this campaign, I said that this campaign would be financed by the individuals of the 5th Congressional District of, of the country who support the campaign, not by corporations. By taking that stance early on, I think that I've created a stark contrast between myself and Scott Kerry. Your issues, your needs are important to me, and that's what I'm going to walk into the fight for. Well, um, as people here know who know me, on am I allowed to say glass eagle? On this question, I have been up and down the state for the last year, and it is a result of my work and my supporters that we got the state AFL CIO to support a resolution in support of Marcy Captor's bill, and we did get Congressman Donald Payne, unfortunately, who is no longer with us, and Frank Pallone on board as co-sponsors. Uh, so I intend to do what I say I intend to do. You also know that I do not intend to lie to you or to uh, dissemble my beliefs on matters which we disagree on. For example, the young man in the back asked about cap and trade and carbon, and I could figure out the profile of people in this room, which is that probably most of you think that human beings are destroying the planet with carbon dioxide. It's simply not the case, and I'm prepared to risk the ire and unpopularity and whatever you think to stand here and tell you that I've done the research and it's not true. So I will represent what I say I will represent and I will fight for it, and that's what it will take to defeat Scott Garrett. Yeah, why? Well, we have a question here. I'll, I'll ask the question. Um, in the last FEC report, um, you had $793 cash on hand. You had nothing. Um, it's obviously going to take on And Dustin had nothing as well. I don't think he's even poured the pack yet. Um, it costs money to run a campaign. Scott Garrett has $1.87 million to do what he will with it. How do you propose to reach these voters? Because you'll never reach everybody individually to shake their hand and talk to them without having any funds to do it. So, go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I think the two of us actually agree that money's not going to buy this election. <laughs> That's one thing we agree on. Um, I think the amount of money people spend on elections, frankly, is absurd. And I'm trying to figure out how they spend so much money. Uh, my colleague, Keisha Rogers, won the Democratic primary in Texas. I think she spent about $30,000. This was the 22nd District, Tom DeLay's former district, and she went on to get 67,000 votes, over 30% of the vote in a hardcore Republican stronghold. She was the most supported Democrat in any Republican district in the state. And the way it was done is traditional grassroots organizing, which is what I have been doing so far. Admittedly, I would like to spend more money. I don't think I need anywhere near $2 million to win this election. It's a question of the ideas, having the ability to, to get out massive amounts of literature, using the internet and so on to reach the voters, and then you know running around like a lunatic and not sleeping and, and seeing them. And that's what I think it will take to win this election. I agree with you. It's going to, we have to, we have to get out, and we have to meet the voters, and we have to let the voters know that this is an important election. And I agree. We don't need two, three, four, however many millions of dollars to win this election. What we need to do is we, we need to do it smart. We 
we need to do it in an intelligent fashion. We need to have a, a targeted, strategic approach to make sure that the voters of the district understand where Scott Garrett stands. You don't need five million dollars to do that. Um, I will say to you this: one of the one of the problems with government is that it's very, very slow. And we submitted our FEC report, but we had to submit a paper one, you know, paper copy. Um, and hopefully they'll get around to publishing that. That'll be nice. Um, it'll also be nice when they when, when they you know correct the district and, and, and do a lot of things. So um, actually did submit the FEC report. Actually have formed a pact. We have actually raised um, some funds. And I think that um, in, from February 29th until the end of the day, that the 30th. It was uh, it was roughly something to the effect of thirteen thousand um, dollars from small donations, which is great. Um, and you know we have actually been fundraising, so hopefully they'll really release really support. But to go back to the question, how are we going to finance this campaign? Well, I'm going to do exactly what I've been doing. I'm going I'm to say to all of you, it's expensive to run campaigns. It's expensive to run elections. It's it's a sacrifice both in time and in money. And the only way that it's going to happen is if you all can support your candidates, if you all can write checks and know that we are going to spend that money in a responsible manner. <coughs> no amount of money that Scott Garrett can raise is going to erase his record. But through the help and support of the community and individuals who are con contributing to the campaigns, we will get through and we will defeat Scott Garrett and his $3 million war chest, or $2 million war chest, however many millions he has. Make sure everybody who has a chance to ask a good question. What is your stance on the constitutionality of the National Defense Authorization Act? Okay. Yeah. Um, the NDAA was signed by Obama on New Year's Eve. It allows for the military, anyone that they consider to be a so-called terrorist, to be detained indefinitely without trial and therefore it is strictly unconstitutional and should be repealed. Difficult question, I'm going to tell you, uh, because we have, we have detainees right now who are in Guantanamo Bay. We have individuals who we, we have denied rights to, and the reason that they are there is because the government doesn't know what to do with them. I don't think that there's a there's a, a silver bullet that I can give you because if we repeal it, it, I don't think it's going to change what is happening with those individuals who are in Guantanamo Bay. Um, I said earlier I, I believe that we should all have rights, but I can also tell you that when I go to war, as I've gone, um, and we go to war with rules. Someone can fire at me. Try to take my life. Then throw down their weapon and wave a white flag. And because we go to rules with war, we abide by those those rules because we're not in our nation, but we are still wearing the flag of the United States of America. I don't believe that we should torture individuals. I don't think that we should hold individuals and detain them without charging them. But I can tell you that we have gone so far down this path, down this rabbit hole, that simply repealing that piece of legislation is not going to solve the problem that we're in. It will stop us from making mistakes moving forward, but it's not as simple as that. And I, I, I want everyone to understand that the issues that we're talking about aren't going to be surmised in two minutes. If, if, they, if, if they could be, I'm sure that one of the 436 people, either the president, the members of Congress, or the Senate, will would have at least gotten somewhere close to the right answer. But they haven't. So, am I allowed to vote? No, but uh, I'm going to go here. We'll make sure the back. This is directed, directed to you, Jason. There are three times in the three pieces of legislation that you've taken the position that we've gone so far down this path that it's too a single payer, the NBA and Glass Eagle, that we passed we've gone so far past that reinstating them or rescinding them won't do any good. 
frankly, I find that to be intellectually dishonest and um, completely confusing. So could you please help me to understand how you have arrived at this once we've gone down this path we can't fix it position? I, I think the first time I used um, down the rabbit hole was just here. Um, it's the same thing. Yeah. What, what I'm, and let me let me be clear because yeah, I'd like that. Um, I've tried to be, and if I've been amb amb ambiguous, I apologize. Um, these are not simple issues. We, you can't say you, you can't say to the to the, the the children who are on their parents' health care right now. Um, we're going to we're going to repeal this piece of legislation. We're going to repeal the uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, and you no longer have insurance. You can't. What I'm saying is that you don't, you add to the problem, you add to the problem by simply pulling the carpet from underneath them. What we do in government is we recognize that pieces of legislation aren't perfect. What we do is we recognize, I, I, you know, you can roll your eyes and I, 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 I'm just trying to be honest with you. And if you, if you, don't, if you don't agree with my honesty, that is, that is your prerogative. But what I'm saying to you is this. We have to exhaust every possible measure before we say to a student or to a, a child, we're taking you off your parents' health care. You now have it, tomorrow you don't because we repealed it. We have, for someone who was in Iraq, for someone who was in the infantry, I can tell you that simply picking up and changing the course of action or changing direction is not always prudent. We owe it to the American people. We owe it to the students. We owe it to the individuals who are being adversely affected as well as benefiting <coughs> from pieces of legislation to make sure that we're doing the right thing. I, I can only leave it there because they're complicated issues. I, I can't give you a silver bullet response. And if, if you think that there is a silver bullet to any one of these issues, and I'd be open to having a conversation with you so that you can educate me, because I don't know everything, but I will work my best for you. All right, we have one time for one more question before closing, and I want somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Go ahead. What, what's your feeling about the, the controversy between the wealthy tax rate and the regular people's tax rate? So you're asking about basically tax fairness? Would you yeah, proceed? Fairness and tax. Okay. This time, why don't you go off Um. Well, I don't see anything wrong with a millionaire's tax as it's been proposed. But I will say that taxing the rich more, which probably is also an order, is not going to solve the financial collapse and does not guarantee that people on the lower end are going to live better. Uh, that we have to do what I said at the beginning, which is to reinstate Glass-Steagall, restore a national banking system based on credit so that we can actually spend money building what we need to build. And believe me, if we tax all the millionaires, it actually wouldn't generate enough money to build major infrastructure that we need. But building it will pay for itself in the long term, and that's the only way that, that this crisis can be addressed. That may be slightly more complex than what you were looking for, but that's my answer. I believe that I believe that we all need to pay our fair share of taxes. I think I believe the tax bill needs to be fair and it needs to be equitable. And we addressed it earlier. It's, it's very, very complicated, but at the same time, it doesn't benefit those in the middle class. The millionaires and billionaires have armies of accountants and they've got legions of lawyers that are going to protect their wealth. I think that if you are making millions of dollars every year and you're paying 12, 13, 14 percent effective tax rate and people who are making less than $100,000 a year are paying 28, 29, 30% in their tax rate. I think that there's something 
incredibly well with that. Because I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but the cost of gasoline is going up. And that that five dollar a gallon price tag is hitting the pockets of ordinary Americans much harder than it is people in the stratosphere of wealth. We have to close corporate tax controls. We have to we have to reform the system. I'll give you one example, and it's one I use all the time. Let's take a piece of art. Are there any artists in the room? Let's say, let's say you're you sell your painting to someone who's extremely wealthy, and you sell your painting. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you sell your painting to them for five thousand dollars. And because you're a great artist and your your work serves you quite well and, and people can see it, that, that artwork appreciates. It appreciates to say, let's be optimistic, fifty thousand dollars. <coughs> well, a wealthy person can now take that piece of artwork. They can donate it to a five oh one C three organization that's recognized by the government, and they can write off what the artist worth, not the amount that they paid for. I don't know about you all, but I can't afford a $5,000 piece of artwork. I can think of a lot of bills that can be paid, and I can think of a lot of student loans that can be paid down with that $5,000. But I don't have the opportunity to do that. By putting more money back in the pockets of ordinary Americans, you are going to stimulate the economy. Because if there are goods and services out there that people can't pay for, then they're not going to buy them. So we need to make the tax code fair and equitable. Okay. Is that I would like to suggest they each have two minutes right, to wrap up. I'd like to suggest the subject to one. One of you is going to win in June, and one of you wins in November. You're going to Congress, okay? What are you, you're going to be one of 420, 435 people. Members of the House. We know what's going on down there. Gridlock is the name of the game. The Democrats have some fancy ideas about uh, taking up control of the house for most of us. So how are you going to spend your two years? What are you going to do for the fifth district? Is that okay? Do you want to accept that as a as a wrap up? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, answer you want it. To spend that answer it, and we'll give you the two minutes. Answer it, and we'll give you the two minutes. And you also have to stand on your head <laughs> and we're do a little juggling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but short of that. No, no. Do you let feel like be, incorporating some of the... Let that be a final question. question. Okay. And then we'll give them okay. minutes. Well, I guess it's the, the host <laughs> brought it to... <laughs> executive privilege. Executive privilege to force you in front of the audience. What will you do? Uh, what will you do in Washington that if will you win the election? You know, I'm, assuming you, I'm assuming you... I'm assuming if we have another Katrina, you'll vote for... Uh, emergency relief. Emergency relief. Which you didn't, which you didn't do. What else will you do? You get to go first on this one, and then, and then, we'll, have and then we'll have the two-minute we'll close-up. And then we'll have a When I win this election and go down to Washington, I'm going to do, I'm going to be focused. First and foremost, we're going to start, we have to start by reaching across the aisle. We have to start by coalition building. We have to start by getting individuals to understand that, that we can pass pieces of legislation that transcend partisan ideology and will actually do things for the American people. We focus on jobs in the economy. We focus on, you know, for me, one of the things I want to do, and I said it earlier, is I want to, to build coalitions between private industry and our community colleges and our trade organizations. I want to, I want to get them to, to subscribe to the idea that that investment will give them better workers and that we can hire the long-term unemployed. That's the first thing. But no piece of legislation is going to get through if you don't build a coalition, if you don't reach across the aisle, if you're, if you're not willing to sit down with someone who you might be divided ideolo ideologically on, but can express to them that we're all united in our common struggle. That's the first thing I would do. The next thing I would do is I would work on the education initiative. I believe that the greatest investment that we can make today is, in, is in an investment in the education of our children. Because, well, if we don't, do we really want to leave the world behind? We have to. I mean, that's just the nature of life. We, we have to. But we need to make sure that they're best prepared for the 21st century. 
Um, what I will not do is punt an import, important piece of legislation into the next term. No next term is guaranteed. And hopefully, in this election, we'll be able to show Scott Garrett that. No next term is guaranteed. So you legislate today, and you do things today, even though they may not be politically popular or politically expedient, if it's the right thing for your constituency, then that's what you fight for, tooth and nail. And that's what I'll do as your congressman. Well, when I win the election, I think what I'm going to do is get a bunch of buses, and everybody here is going to get on them, and we're going to go down to Washington, and we're going to get Glass-Steagall reenacted, and we're going to repeal the NDAA, and we're actually going to put an end to these insane policies of war and, and overthrowing every dictator on the planet because they offended us or said we should eat our broccoli like Bush Sr. And um, <laughs> we actually, we're going to have have to take emergency measures to save the country. And you can say that one congresswoman out of uh, 435 may not be much, but one who is aggressive and determined to get the job done can recruit other people. Because I happen to know there are a lot of people on both sides of the aisle who agree with what we're saying, and they're gutless. And they're under pressure from Wall Street, and they're under pressure from the president, and they won't take a stand. But a few people taking a stand and sticking their neck on the line will inspire other people to take a stand. And it will probably be the case that I will need backup from my base in the 5th District to go down there and get this done. But that would be my intention. Okay, uh, let's have some closing arguments here. I think you will get to close first. You made the first statement, so you... Right. Those right, those so you get to close first, two minutes. I'd like for us to not lose sight of the fact that we have an incredible opportunity in this election. We have an incredible opportunity in this election to retire Garrett. I think there's an organization called Retire Garrett. We have an opportunity because in this newly drawn district, we're almost evenly put. I'm not going to be able to do it alone. I'm going to need all of your support. But we have an opportunity to make our community a much better place. What I want you to take away from this forum is that none of the issues that we discussed are easy issues. There is no silver bullet that's going to resolve all the bad that has been done. I know many of you may disagree because we've heard Glass Eagle more and more and more this evening. But we cannot pin our hopes on a single piece of legislation. Now, I would be one to argue that some of the comments tonight might alienate people that we have to build coalitions with in Washington. I'd also argue that we can't continue to step out on extremes because that's what our current congressman has been doing. We have to go down understanding that we have focus, we have passion, we have the support of our constituency, and we're there to do right by the people that we're representing. I, I, I'm not going to stand before you and say that some of the issues that we've discussed are going to be resolved in a single term, but I'm going to do my damnedest to make sure that I work for you every single day as a congressman and advocate for you the way that we are not being advocated for now. Thank you. Well, I would say that we currently have a president who is extreme. There is not a jot of difference between his policies and those of the previous administration. And I am sorely disappointed in the Democratic Party for refusing to stand up to these policies because we might have had a different candidate had the party been willing to do that. So, uh, and I am emphatically not supporting any of the Republican candidates who seem to be absolutely identical or perhaps would start nuking Iran sooner. Um, the nation has a crisis, and as I said in the beginning, my view is that there are three urgent steps. The reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, the restoration of a Hamiltonian banking system as it states in our Constitution where the Congress has the authority to issue credit for great projects 
and the construction of Nawafa. And I would ask that people here, whether or not you choose to support my candidacy or my campaign, commit yourselves to fighting on principle for what you know to be right and to have the courage to stand up against perceived popular opinion. Because only if the American people begin to do that are we going to save our nation.